så sætter du dig ned, og så kommer der et panel med fire også. Ja. Øh, og, og så stiller jeg dem nogle spørgsmål, ja. og så når vi eventuelt et spørgsmål eller to fra salen øh, til dem eller til jer. Ja. Så, ja. Okay. Um, er der hul igennem, som man siger? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen. So, ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. We may have one or two uh, latecomers stepping in, but uh, we'll allow them to, to step in. But uh, for, for time sake, we start the program. Uh, nice to see all of you here. We also have uh, people with us uh, uh, online uh, watching in. So for that reason, we, uh, we make sure to use the microphone, although we may be able to shout so you can all hear us in the room. My name is Hans-Peter Slente uh, from the Confederation of Danish Industry. I'm very pleased to welcome you at this workshop, which uh, deals with district heating uh, as a means for sector integration and energy efficiency. I'm very proud that we have uh, gathered a uh, a good battery, a good panel of people, uh, some of the real experts and movers and shakers within district heating. And I talked to certain, uh, some people uh, when planning this and uh, who should we actually invite to make sure we, you know, do it right and get the, a good beginning. And they all pointed at one person, which is standing beside me, which is Brian Vad Mathisen, uh, to give a European exp exp uh, uh, perspective on district energy and the potentials. So please, uh, the floor is yours, Brian. Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation, uh, Hans. Um, so we are. Uh, I'm going to tell you something about district energy in European perspective. I hope you can all see the slides here. Uh, the, the, when I talk about district energy, I always talk about this as part of uh, of the entire system. You can't talk about buildings or district energy without understanding what kind of system you're in. I'm going to talk about this from two projects, uh, one called Synergies and, and Heat Roadmap Europe. You can sign up for newsletters. We're going to send out uh, new stuff the coming months here. Um, we, uh, we all know what the problem is right now, and I think, I think heating is, is really a, 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 a big problem. If we, um, if we look at the, the crisis that we have, uh, uh, Europe has been rather naive, in my opinion, and uh, we we have uh, we have had a, a commission uh, from 2015 who talked about uh, the energy union. Probably you know that, rather successful in renewables and energy efficiency, rather unsuccessful in natural gas because the strategy on natural gas was a diversification strategy, uh, access to more markets, and not a gas exit strategy. And we had a situation where we talked about gas as a transition fuel, which is true somewhat in the power sector, which we can exchange with biogas, but which is certainly not true when we talk about low temperature heat, 40, 50 degrees heat. Uh, we should never use gas for any, uh, any of that. Europe is, uh, has, has accepted to change the geopolitical situation because if you look at the maps, you can see all of the pipelines with oil and gas going across Eastern Europe, which of course changes if we had built Nord Stream 2, we could have delivered all of the natural gas and uh, avoided all of, these, uh, all of these pipelines. In 2020, we sent around 70 billion euros to Russia uh, every year. Most of it is oil uh, money. Uh, today, that amount, if, if we had an entire 2022, which we are not because we are changing our supply chains, then that would probably be the triple amount because of the higher, much higher prices that we have right now. So what are the solutions? The solutions are two things. Renewable energy, uh, wind and PV falling in prices, 
And then, of course, energy efficiency, which we're going to, to be talking uh, about here today. Um, energy efficiency is many things, and it's rather complicated. I listened to the debate down here. Um, there's so many elements where you can say, well, it's nice to have the ETS working, but it's not going to change a lot in all of the sectors unless we address the sectors one by one and the problems one by one. We have tried in, uh, in a project called Synergies to look at all sectors. And, uh, and what we're doing there is we have a bottom-up approach for industry, for buildings, for transport, uh, and try to understand this in all of the EU countries. Uh, we started this project before Brexit, so we actually have the UK in it as well. So we have very detailed knowledge about uh, all of the countries and all of the sectors. And when we do that, we try to, uh, to look at uh, the sectors, combine it, and also understanding the grids. We make a, a also a spatial analysis, so where, for example, is transport able to change, or district heating able to be implemented. And we put it into our modeling, um, where we, of course, see all of the supply chain effects of energy efficiency. Here we can see things like it matters that we're not putting in only heat pumps in all of the millions of buildings in Europe, because if we only put in individual heat pumps, our power supply needs to be extremely high when it's winter. We can reduce that with more energy efficient buildings, but we'll still have a problem in a lot of cities around Europe. We can see that. We can see that the cost change. We can see if we use hydrogen, the cost uh, increase. But there are sectors where we need hydrogen. So we need to direct it at those sectors and not use it for, for low temperature purposes. When we have done this exercise, we have looked at um, the results in a, a report called A Clean Planet for, uh, uh, for All, uh, where the Commission has put out some, some scenarios for, um, for EU about how to mitigate uh, 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 greenhouse gas emissions. It's called 1.5 Tech, uh, the main scenario, which means that we're climate neutral in Europe in 2050. We have tried to model that and try to look at what is the energy efficiency in, in these scenarios. And what we can see is, uh, for example, here, here's the final energy demand and here's the primary energy demand in those scenarios that the, the Commission has come out with. They're not really looking a lot at energy efficiency because this represents the loss in, in these systems. We suggest another kind of system, which you see here, where we have reduced all of these losses, not because we don't have losses, but because we have a sectoral integration of these things. This really matters a lot. It matters a lot in so many ways. Here you see the final energy demand divided into sectors, and uh, we, have, we have actually a slightly higher demand for energy in buildings than the Commission has. What does that mean? Well, what we're, what we're trying to say here is to have a 40, 40 to 45 percent savings in buildings is extremely expensive. Not that we should not have very high ambition on it, but if we change our focus to both have energy efficiency in the buildings, maybe up to 32, 35 percent, then we combine that with district heating and waste heat utilization, we can actually reduce this gap between uh, the final energy and the primary energy and still have a lower, uh, uh, lower demand for, for, for energy compared to what the Commission is doing. Um, when we do that, we are also able to reduce our... Um, uh, to, uh, we're also able to see how much wind power and how much solar power we will, ha we, we will need in these kind of systems. And even though we are, uh, are not using uh, uh, nuclear in our, our scenarios, we're actually able to, to have the same kind of, the same level of, of renewables as the 1.5 tech scenario. So we're able to create a system where we have energy efficiency in focus and where we have a, a, a possibility to base it on, on renewable energy. One of the key things to understand is energy storage. Energy storage is a key part of sector integration. And if we store all of our 
energy in the electricity sector, it's going to be extremely expensive. Most of the times, uh, storing uh, uh, energy in, uh, in electricity, even those cheap ones, which is called pumped hydro, you know them from, from, uh, from Switzerland, Austria, places like that where you pump things up. They, even that is uh, very much more expensive uh, than, than simply having a thermal storage. Thermal storage you have here, it's a pit storage, one uh, euro per kilowatt hour compared to 125 for a, a pump storage. Now, you can't charge your phone on thermal energy, but you can certainly shower, which we will also need to do in the future, and you can certainly heat a house, which we will need to have uh, uh, to some extent uh, in the future. Um, you can also uh, use our results here, actually, to, to have a look at your home hometown you can you can have a look at uh, what we call PETA the pan-european thermal atlas and you can see if there's a potential for district energy and if there's a potential for waste heat based on the existing industrial sectors in Europe and uh, what we are what we're trying to to do here is to illuminate the possibilities over here I put in the, this is the Netherlands the Netherlands is a special case for me because the Netherlands is the same size as Denmark, but uh, they're three times as many people. They only have 3% district heating. We have maybe 55% district heating. They have more waste heat than they need in all of their buildings, actually almost double the amount, but they still have 3% district heating. It means it's not a technical problem to have district heating. It means that waste heat utilizations require not the ETS, of course it's nice to have the ETS as well, but it also requires on the ground possibilities for, uh, for these, um, um, for these um, uh, systems to be uh, exploited. One of the things that we are, we are looking at is all of the buildings in Europe. Now you, you can't see all the details, but these are all the countries. And these are the uh, energy savings that we're suggesting to, uh, to do. And we're suggesting to do uh, up to around 40% uh, reductions in the building sector uh, across Europe. And that is, that is then uh, combined with uh, different heat supply options in Europe. We believe that actually there's around 60% uh, of, of the uh, district heating can be, can be sourced from, from waste heat. We're not utilizing all of that because that will be unrealistic. There will be technical challenges locally, but the possibilities are there. What you see here, for example, is, is Germany. Waste, waste heat potential is here. This is the total heat demand. This is what we suggest to be district energy. This is what we suggest to be individual heat pumps. And we try to look at that in, in all of the countries uh, across Europe, and we have very detailed knowledge about the building stock, the age classes, the cost of the refurbishment, etc., etc. Now, people also wonder what is the heat supply when we do district heating. So here we try to decompose uh, this. We have geothermal, industrial waste heat, power to X waste heat, waste heat, uh, waste incineration, solar thermal large-scale heat pump where we use uh, wind turbines, CHP plants, boilers. So it's, it's really a combination of different options. And if we want to have this kind of system, we published a report uh, two, three years back. It's a roadmap for, uh, for, for heating and cooling in Europe. We can see that we need around uh, almost 9,000 new systems in Europe until 2030 in order to be able to expand this and utilize this district heating. Because if you don't start these new uh, systems, they can't be expanded. And this is why it's really disappointing in Repower EU that there's so much focus on 10 billion more uh, uh, tons of hydrogen and not a lot of focus on, on waste heat and, uh, and waste incineration. Now, then you wonder about the costs, and we can actually reduce the costs, so I won't go too much into that. But one of the 
reasons that we can have a lower cost than, than the, the commission suggestion for a climate neutral system is of course we have a much better use of hydrogen, more efficient mobility sector with a very high electrification rate, but also that we use the synergies and use the waste heat and use the combinations uh, around. Lastly, uh, we have tried also to do a back casting. So what we do towards 2030 needs to be aligned with what we need to do in 2050. Uh, otherwise, we're going in the wrong direction. So we tried to take our scenarios for all the countries and went back to what should we have done if we have different implementation rates on the technologies in 2030. And what we can see is when we compare, this is Repower EU, and this is sort of our scenario. They're actually pretty aligned with what, what the commission is suggesting. Now, there are technical differences, but the ambition level on, on energy efficiency in buildings might be slightly too high, but it's the right sort of level. Uh, the ambition on renewables is the right level. But we do need uh, to start this, this waste heat utilization because we want to go to 2050. And, uh, and we, we suggest here to have 20% district heating instead of 12% today. And in the commission, they have no ambition on, on that kind of thing. So thank you very much, Hans. That was the words from me. Thank you very much, Brian. I, I forgot to introduce you properly. You all have a note here with, uh, with the names of the different speakers and background. You are a professor from Aalborg University, which, as you can see, uh, study heat and other energy sources uh, in a European perspective, among other things. So thanks for that. You can sit down. And uh, towards the end, we may have uh, time for some questions, including for, for Brian and other speakers. The next speaker is, uh, is uh, Lars Tveen who represents uh, Project Zero, uh, who he will tell more about. He also uh, belongs to the, the, the owning fund behind the company Danfoss, which is a, a, a big company uh, in this area, as you may know. Uh, so, uh, so I'm over to you for more. Thanks a lot, Hans-Peter. And thanks a lot, Brian, because I think what you just told is if the world knew what the world knows, try to imagine how fast we could move with all what we are talking about here. That's amazing. And I, 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 and personally, I'm a little bit surprised it's not going faster. But I'm probably less surprised now being part of the IEA conference for a couple of days. Because here, it's, it's very clear now, I think we were 25 uh, Minister of Energy gathered. And I must say, it was unbelievable how much we brought up exactly about energy efficiency, district energy, sector integration, because we need to understand the whole energy transformation is huge. And that means we simply need to do exactly what you were talking about uh, before, uh, Brian. And what is also clear, we don't need to develop something new and wait for that 10 more years. It's already here. And that has actually been one of our main points, and that is actually also the reason that IEA, they selected to come here to Denmark, because they came to Denmark, because as they have said, you have probably also participated in a lot of uh, COP meetings and a lot of other meetings where we are talking a lot, where we are discussing a lot, but at the end of the day, what is really important is that we seeing is believing, that we walk the talk, and that is also why we this morning have been together with the ministers all over the area here. And I just came back from a brick. They are producing bricks uh, 10 kilometers away here. And you can say, what has brick uh, manufacturing to do with all what we are saying here? They are the world's most greenest brick producers. And, and again, typically when we talk to a heavy industry, they say, it's too difficult. We, we don't want to start. We, we, we need to do something else. What, what we have seen here, and they were heavily surprised, uh, I know some of you know, say they have done a lot to the energy efficiency part. They have redesigned, put three holes in the brick, simply to get 20% less energy to dry the bricks, and they are now giving the surplus energy into the district heating. And what they are saying, yes, green architects want green bricks, but what is even more important, green does not necessarily mean it's very expensive if we start with what you just talked about, Brian. 
And, and I think that, that's what Project Zero is all about here in Denmark, here in Sonneborg. And I would say it's not only Sonneborg, it's whole Denmark. And I think we, we should start do much more here. Because what, what, we are, what we are trying and what we should do is actually, we have a recipe for how we are doing. As you just explained, we have 55% district heating in, 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 in Denmark, which is a key component for the future energy system. And, and that is actually what, what we have talked about here also over, over the last couple of days where we have said what, what we are saying here, whatever we do, energy efficiency first. And you say that's logic because it's very often those with the lowest payback times. But it's not logic, logic because it's difficult. It's difficult. You cannot get your hands around it. And that is why I can say what, what we have done here is actually that because I think what is in Sonderburg, we made that promise as said in 2029, we are CO2 neutral. At the moment, we are 52% down since 2007. So we have followed our plans uh, to the point until now. We are still missing the difficult part. But I think the main point here is, if we do that in sectors, if industry is, if Danfoss is saying, we do it all alone, if utilities are saying we do it all alone, if housing associations are saying we're doing it all alone, house owners, etc., banks for that sake, if we do it in silos, we will never ever get what Brian just talked about. So what we have been doing here is that we have gathered 100 people, 100 people from the city council, from the big industries, Danfoss, Lenark, a lot of other industries, smaller uh, SMVs, uh, you t the three utility companies, uh, uh, housing associates, we have we all been together, even banks, because also if we want to go to electric cars, maybe also there need to be some benefit for, for those doing it. But what is interesting is actually that, and I think that's where we can say we have a common goal, and that's where I think the trick, we are not say having a goal in each silo, or any, no, we have a goal for, this, uh, for the munici municipality of Sonderborg. And that's why we have achieved those 52%. And that's act. And, and we are not here to, to set up on a pedestal, say, oh, how great we are. No, we're here to say we can do that in all cities in Denmark, all cities in Europe, all cities in the whole world. And that's what we are trying to do in a super, super simple way. And that is actually why we have created those cases here. Because sometimes, I can also say, I've been working for Danfoss many years. I also see we have a few here and saying, we are so nerdy. We love to explain how difficult it is and how technical it is. And the decision makers of tomorrow's, that's not those having those technical skills. So we need to understand, if we want people to understand that, we need pixie books or very easy understandable cases where we can say, okay, let's do that. And all the technical part, let somebody else do that because that's not needed to make the decisions because you're talking to people who has done it before. And I think the best example is actually what we have been doing at the headquarter of, of Danfoss. We have 250,000 square meters headquarter a little bit north of here. Uh, in 2007, we started to focus, actually when Project Zero started, we started focusing to see if we could do more. And we actually achieved for the, uh, we reduce the heating demand by 70%, seven zero demand, seven zero percent from seven until today. And then a lot of people are saying also, the, yeah, if Danfoss wouldn't do it, who would then do it? But we can say all those initiatives we have done, zero of those have had a payback time longer than three years. So we are talking about interest rates here of 30% or more. It's very hard to find that somewhere. And the good part with energy efficiency, it's not, it's not down the drain. It's building up year after year after year. So that was the first part. The second part was exactly what, what Brian was talking about. We have also now connected to the data center we, we have up there. But I think the most important part were we have a district heating network just outside our factory. And they were building a new uh, heating plant. They had problems with the peak power for the 20 cold day where it's cold. And they were in there to see how they should ensure that capacity. When we started to discuss with them and said, we actually have an 18 megawatt boiler. 
we could fuel with biogas at Danfoss. Why are we not those 20 days where it's cold, you buy heat from us, the remaining part of the days, we buy heat from you. Again, payback time, less than three years. And I think that's, that's what this is all about, also the whole Project Zero, because we fully complete, and we work very close together with Brian and, and all his uh, people also from, yeah, from all. So I think we know where the North Star actually is. We know where we want to go, but we need to get people up running. We need to make people move. And we see that the best example is simply make it very super simple, the first steps, and then let's work together. Let's inspire each other, because that's the main thing. Because sometimes, and that's why I'm always saying, if the world knew what the world knows, if, because how many industri industrial parks do we have like Danfoss? We have them all over the globe. Could we do the same as we did for Denver? We could do that all over the globe. So, but again, why are we not doing it? Because we don't know how to do it. And that's where we should start. And that is actually also why I, I think what we, what we are talking about here, both the district heating, the sector coupling, and exactly as you're saying, do we disagree with heat pumps? Of course we need heat pumps. But let's also ensure that we're putting them in the right uh, place in the energy system as far back as possible. So I, I think that is also where, where we are. And I think the main learnings to finish is actually what we have learned, we need local ambitions. We have now taken the municipality of Sonborg. We need local stakeholders. We need local uh, energy systems. And if we have that, then we can start moving. We can start working with the experts. We can start work, but we have 100 people who want the same, and they are all in the same boat. It's all about team sport. And if that's the case, yes, then we can move it. So with that, thanks a lot for the time. Thanks a lot, Lars Tveen, for this engaging speech and also uh, uh, pointing to the Pixie books. I'll point to a couple of uh, Pixie books you can bring home or link up to afterwards as well uh, for, for your benefit. Now I'd like to ask a, f a panel of uh, four uh, experts up here. Uh, they are from uh, different companies, global companies, uh, some of them headquartered in Denmark and some very active in district heating in Denmark as well. Um, it's Henrik Bjergaard, it's uh, Martin Petersen, it's uh, Sten Schiele Jensen, it's Carsten Østergaard Petersen. Um, and uh, you have promised to deliver a few, uh, some, some, some points on, on your work with, uh, with district uh, uh, energy. So my first question to, to you, we can take it uh, around. Um, in, uh, each of you may be uh, able to tell uh, which, uh, in which area, in which technology area are you contributing to efficiency and uh, sector coupling within uh, district heating. Please. Yes, sure. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation, Hans Peter. I'm happy to be here. <coughs> well, Kingspan Locks, we are the backbone of the district heating system. We do the pre-insulated pipes. We did them yesterday, we did them today, do them today, and we'll do them for tomorrow's solutions as well. And as just mentioned by uh, Brian and Lars, the district heating system, is the, the piping system is the backbone for the developing all the system and taking waste heat into account. At the same time, I would like to add that uh, when you do this, look at the total cost of ownership. Last year, take the, take the cheapest way overall, because then you make sure you invest properly up front and you have lower operation cost. So you don't invest too little and have high operations cost and don't have the possibility to expand the system. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'm from ABB. We, I would say we have two layers. We have the, the backbone, which is the electrical, the motors, the drives, the instrumentation of the complete system, but when we talk about efficiency and sector coupling, the, the, the main part that we try to contribute is an automated, automation system going back 35 years, trying to automate the system, but then as everything expands with surplus heat, heat pumps, power to X surplus heat, we need an overall umbrella that can orchestrate all this, and, and, and this is what we are trying to do. And, I would like to send out the message that also from the panel down there, we already have the technology, but we need to gather all the data so that we can accomplish what actually Lars and Brian are saying, because it's possible. It's already out there. Steen? Yes, uh, Steen from Kampstrup. First of all, we uh, measure energy consumption, and uh, I think that's uh, important, of course, to build the customer and to create transparency also in these times with, uh, with very high energy costs. 
Uh, but it's certainly also important in, uh, in an energy efficiency context, simply because uh, we cannot optimize what we do not measure. So everything starts with, with the tra transparency into our, our energy consumption. Um, so from camps, we do digital solutions to, to uh, help the energy providers to optimize and implement uh, energy efficiency measures in their own operation, in the way they they operate and plan and maintain uh, district energy systems, and we provide insights on how to enable them to better engage with end users, also to to engage them in in uh, in increasing their uh, energy efficiency. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so my name is Carsten and I'm uh, from Grundfos and uh, we provide pumps so that we can distribute all the uh, nice, maybe not hot water, but uh, average temperature water for, uh, for heating the buildings. Um, and alone by controlling pumps right and not having these very old uh, uh, uncontrolled pumps, we can save a lot of uh, energy in the systems. But, uh, but we also look more into the hydronic systems, not just the pumps itself. And uh, as, as Brian mentioned earlier, then we need these low temperature district heating grids to actually be able to take all the surplus heat in, uh, in, in the industry and, uh, and the buildings around. And, uh, and we provide a solution now where we, in a more decentralized way, we actually split the, the city into different zones uh, and lower the temperatures uh, according to the demand. So we also have a digitally enabled solutions where we can read out the demand and match that with the temperatures that's actually required for a specific zone. And then we can combine with Denver supermarket solutions where we extract the heat and put that into such a zone. So, uh, yeah. Thanks a lot. We got you all four on the map now. We know uh, what you stand for. Uh, I'd like to ask you where you see, I mean, it may be your technology, but also your customers overall. Where do you, I mean, we're talking about sector integration. My waste is your resource and vice versa. So where are the wasted resources today that district heating can actually utilize better? Where's the biggest potential that you see in your work? Let's take it this way. Okay. Uh, definitely today and yesterday, it's industry. Recently, we published this study in Denmark showing that around 100,000 individual houses would have, uh, there would be plenty of energy for conversion of the individual gas boiler. There are some other figures out there saying 200,000, even 300,000, but there is plenty. So let's do that now by using waste heat from the industry. Later we can discuss data center, later we can just discuss P2X, but industry today. And let us just remind each other that transporting hot water in good Kingsman Lockstar pipe is uh, really with no temperature losses. Over 20 kilometers, transporting hot water about 80 degrees, the temperature drop is one degree. I mean, that was the calculation. In practice, it was half a degree for 20 kilometers, 80 degrees hot water. So it's not a problem. There is still a heat loss, yes, but it's not a problem to transport hot water today. Completely agree. Um, we are controlling uh, 60 kilometers or 80 kilometers uh, just uh, at Middelfart, uh, and there you have a, have a complete loss of only 2%. Um, what I would like to highlight is complexity. I think that we need to acknowledge that if we want to collect heat from wherever it is across the city, it, uh, it increases complexity. In the past, you have one single source of heating and then maybe a gas motor or something like that, but now it's pretty complex. So besides picking up from industry, warehouses, data centers, it's very important that we understand the demand across the city. And that no single person can do that in the control room. So again, I think we all speak the same language. We need that data to make sure that we can deliver lower heat temperature at the right time at the right place from the right source to lower footprint. But I would highlight that right now we see we see that the industry has surplus heat, but in two, three years, uh, we will see power to X and carbon capture and storage, surplus heat, where we really need to focus on where do we need to put those plants so it makes sense in a district heating environment. I, I think that's something that needs to be discussed because right now we see mega complexes just beside each other in Esbjerg, which means that we have 20 times the, the, the heat needed, could we do it in another way so it maybe is distributed more across uh, Denmark because there's going to be a huge heat source there. Thank you. Steve? 
Yes, uh, fully agree that we need to change, of course, the overall uh, production mix that introduces a lot of complexity, like you mentioned, uh, <coughs> Martin. And I think maybe it's worth to mention also here that if you look at the at the cost gradient, so the cost per megawatt per hour for renewables and for waste heat is six to seven times higher per, per degree than for conventional uh, heat sources. So we need to get down in temperature just to underline uh, the importance of, of that. Um, and, and in that respect, we need to look not only at the production source, but also on what happens in the buildings, in a district energy systems. Uh, what happens in the building has a huge impact on the entire uh, system efficiency. We, uh, there is a general uh, acceptance that, uh, that up to half, maybe 60% of all heat installations out there are either faulty or misadjusted and can be adjusted and need to be adjusted if we need to succeed with lower temperatures. So we need to work both on, on, on the production and, and changing the production mix, but we also need to, to work uh, in the buildings, in the heat installations, and connect that across the, the entire system. Also enable the buildings more in, uh, in the district energy system. Yeah, now I'm, I'm last, but I agree uh, very much with these, uh, these gentlemen. And I can add uh, one thing, because I think, I think we can pick up the energy everywhere, and, and, and we have to do that. I mean, we are talking about uh, an energy system where we pick it up where it's available. So, so we're not talking about this one production unit, as, as you also said, but, but from everywhere. And, and some district heating companies are further ahead than others. Uh, and, and in those, you know, we can talk about uh, lowering the temperatures and taking energy from data centers and other things, whereas other places it would be more natural to start with the industrial uh, waste heat at, at higher temperatures and then ingest it directly into the system. But we do see this decentralization that is uh, required to actually uh, manage it all. And, and then again, highlighting the, the buildings because uh, some would claim that the buildings, ah, we cannot take a, a, a lower temperature. We hear that all the time, but we also see all the time that when they try, with a little bit of adjustment in those buildings, they can actually take a much, much lower temperature than what they're used to. Thank you for highlighting different areas where there is uh, potential for further, further gains and uh, utilizing waste in a sector integration way. Now, uh, maybe starting with you then, giving you the benefit, uh, geographically, where do you see the, the best potentials? So we, we heard a little, we saw a little bit from the, uh, also uh, Brian, Professor, about geographically where we are, but maybe you have some, something to add on that. Yeah, so, so uh, geographically, uh, again, it, it really depends on where you are development-wise in, uh, in district heating, for, 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 for that matter. So, so I believe we need these parallel tracks uh, where we, uh, see a, a build out of existing grids, so uh, in, in parts of Europe and now with the gas conversion we see a lot of gas grids just next to district heating, so that's an obvious uh, way to go and convert this into district heating. So, so, so that's one thing that would be very, very relevant in, in a big part of Europe. In, uh, in other places uh, you would simply need to build the district heating grid from, from scratch and use all the available uh, energy sources to make that happen. So that's back to the 9,000, I think you mentioned, uh, Brian. Uh, but we should also not forget, so yesterday I heard about the cooling demand that's just blowing uh, up, up the roof and the growing middle class, uh, class, especially in Asia and Middle East and so on. So district cooling we also need to look into uh, and, and make that a part of the solution instead of having these individual chillers uh, around the world. I think there's a lot of things to harvest there. So, uh, yeah, we can do things everywhere, uh, but it's different things that we need to do. Thank you. Steen, anything to add? Yeah, and uh, I really like the heat roamer Europe approach, and I think it's, it's so obvious that we need more district energy in these 9,000 systems because there's more uh, waste heat than, than heat demand. Uh, and then it's, yeah, the key question is how to, to make it happen. And, and I think... Uh, Maybe we should mention also here the heat planning. Uh, I think the, the basic for our success in Denmark has been a, a long-term heat planning. We see that taking up, especially in Germany uh, and in Baden-Württemberg, where they, they have now enforced this mandatory heat planning for the 100 largest cities. I think that's a, a really good initiative, and, a, and I think that is needed to make things happen in countries like Germany. We see it moving in the Netherlands. Uh, so, so there are certainly many interesting countries 
across Europe to look into, and then cooling, like you mentioned also, Karsten. Yeah, I, I of course agree. I, I think there, there, there are two low-hanging fruits. The one that the, the Karsten is talking about, where we expand what we already have today, when we have a district heating system. I think when we talk about energy efficiency, um, when we look at Ukraine, Mongolia, China, we are talking about, and I think if you put these companies together, we could have the energy consumption, but deliver the same amount of uh, comfort to the end customers in those countries. I mean, we'd, we have done a lot of those analysis across those countries, and the payback is sometimes three months. So, so there's a huge potential there. Then, of course, um, in, in, in the rest of, of Europe, where you already have district heating systems, where you maybe going to build that, but also where you have a gas infrastructure. I, I like Brian showing the Netherlands. It, it's a classical example where it's, it's quite easy to convert from gas to district heating because it's based on a, on a water-based uh, heating system inside of the buildings. Yes, some of them needs a reconstruction, a uh, smaller part, but it's much easier than if you had elect electricity warming. So where you already have district heating, where you're going to optimize and expand it, and where you have a gas infrastructure, where it's waterborne, I think those are the two low-hanging fruits. And going to countries, UK, the Netherlands, in Europe, and US and Canada, that's really where it's going to happen. Thanks for that. Can I? I might add a few things, no, <laughs> but I, we agree, of course we agree. Um, overall, we have the renovation of the existing networks, and I'm just trying to find my German colleagues around in, in, this, uh, in this room. We can cut the losses in half, including digitalization, new pipes and redesign. That's one thing to do. The other thing is, of course, expansion of uh, network. Holland is a brilliant example because just last week they had a new, the government just announced a new uh, energy policy, including where they said that uh, district heating is underutilized. And you just mentioned, and I'll use that next week during the royal visit, that uh, the surplus heat in Holland is at a 50% district heating rate. The surplus heat is enough for that. Was that the? No, no, you can, uh, you can supply uh, twice as much as you need. 80% okay. more buildings than they have in the Netherlands with the waste heat they have. Today. Today. And then we have the PTX on top of that. Yes. Okay. But the other thing we also need to do in these countries, and it is happening now, that is consumer protection and it's industry regulation. Consumer protection gives itself because as we uh, offer this fine opportunity to the consumers, we need to help to protect the consumers and we need to make sure that the industry investments, uh, and the investment environment for the industry is there to ensure a long-term uh, profit, to, to be honest. And this is a long-term solution. Thanks a lot. Time is running. We have time for one or two questions from, uh, from you, the audience. So if anybody ventures a question, yes, there's one there. Please state who you are. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much for the talk. So uh, I'm Aaron Mornan, Head of um, District Heating Policy in the UK. Um, I wanted to talk to Martin's point about uh, data. Uh, so as the UK is starting to think about its, well, as England is starting to think about its heating zoning policy, which buildings should connect, what are some of the most important sources or types of data that are needed to work out where district heating should be situated? Yes, well, um, already now we have some en engagement with some of the district heating companies in the UK. Um, and they are always surprised when we tell them how little data we actually need to increase efficiency and make sure that they get the best out of the biomass, the waste, or whatever they have. So, I, I, I mean, if you have a, a comp stop um, meter and you have some valves out of the network, six, seven points for those small uh, networks, that's it. You don't need much more. And, and, and that's actually also our message. It's not that complicated. We can make it very complicated, but I think Lars has a very good point. This has, we have been trial and run this for many, many years. The way we are operating the district heating system in Copenhagen, yes, it's getting better and better and better. But back then, when we started in the 80s, it was still pretty good. And, and, and it is a proven system, it's a proven operation system. So I, I think that's, that's a clear message. We have already done this for 35 years. UK is ready. I mean, there's a lot of surplus heat. Um, what, what always bothers me when I'm in the UK visiting customers is that we have built this nice biomass plant, a waste to energy plant. 
and it's ready for district heating, but nobody is going to, uh, to utilize it. So. Thank you. Would there be one more question? Anyone ventures? Yes, I'll give you the mic. Uh, Jan Hansen from SV Systems. Uh, we operate in, in the UK. Um, we're talking about you know, easy access to waste heat and the rest of it, and you're saying it's not complicated. Um, I've been working with it for now 10, 15 years. It's deeply complicated. And isn't the challenge is that we have so much knowledge between you, you four companies, five, ten companies, but when you go out, you go out and sell on your own. We don't link it up that easily, yeah? That, that's, that's what I say. So, so how can we achieve that? So that's my question. How can we achieve a better linking? Because there's so much knowledge here. But, you know, when you work in the country, then, you know, that's not easy. It's complicated. And the decisions are not, not easy to be made. At one end, it is really uh, energy planning at municipality levels. But that's where you see where you, see where you have the surplus heat. So that's one thing. Energy planning, energy planning, energy planning. The other thing we proposed in Denmark was to have a travel team going around to the different municipalities discussing uh, use of surplus heat. We haven't quite found the funding for that yet, but we are working on it. But like we had the heat pumps uh, traveling team, having one for surplus heat from a uh, government body, a neutral way. So energy planning, uh, yes, I'm going. Yeah, well, but I think you agree then, then that, uh, and, and there has been different initiatives uh, over the past years in Denmark also to to do like uh, different uh, system export initiatives, uh, more or less uh, successful. Uh, I, I fully agree that if we interconnect the different technologies we have across uh, us four companies here and other companies as well, uh, we have some very strong solutions. And I think also as, as technology providers, we need to be better at, at integrating our solutions um, to, to serve each other good and to, to tie the whole uh, district energy value chain together in a better way. Yeah, yeah I, I agree very much on, on the knowledge. So you need the, the knowledge going across. So maybe we should have like a consultant layer on, on top of the four of us because they can look through and, and see, okay, how can we utilize the Grundfos solution with the Kampstrup solution, with the ABB and, and the Logster solution. And it is complicated, but it's, it's definitely possible to do. Uh, so. so um, so, so we need that, uh, that level to be part of it as well. Uh, one small comment. Uh, one advertise for Danish Board of District Heating that is trying to promote this. Um, if, you, if you haven't got any contact, please. No, no, Good. I, and, 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 and one experience from the UK was, uh, oh, sorry, Scotland, was at the COP26. Uh, um, the ministry gathered a lot of different um, industries together. And there we were in a very small room discussing these possibilities from different angles. And, and I, I, I would really encourage inviters for just to talk about what is your difficulties now, how, what have we seen in the past, how are we doing today? Because the, what we also experienced as the industry was that the main worry from, from the minister was, well, my constituency, will they still have a job? We had an issue when we had the offshore wind. We thought there would be a lot of job. There was no job. What if we do, um, do we have enough people to actually do the job when we start doing the investment, etc.? So having that point of view, giving to us, say, you need to come up with that kind of uh, uh, solutions or answers to those questions that bothers me in my day-to-day -day work. I think that's the conversation that we need to do. Yeah, I just wanted to reflect a bit on, on your question about the UK. Uh, I really hope you go to heatroadmapeurope.eu to, to have a look. We have the UK in, in there. Uh, now, you're talking a lot about technologies. There's a lot of other things than technologies here. I think we have to realize these things are about trust, uh, in my opinion. If we want district heating in Europe, in, well, in the entire world, <laughs> really, we need to understand that heating is a complex uh, entity. It's not like electricity. It's something that's related to humans, in my opinion. So you need to build trust. And that means that it should be your idea as a local body. It shouldn't be a consultancy overarching your companies that is coming in. They can maybe help somewhat. But it has, the initiative has to come from, from your side. And this, in my opinion, means that if we look at the European level, in EU, they can do something top down. comes down to the governmental level. 
they can do regulation that enables things, but the enabling things should, uh, the, the real things that happen should come from the ground because it, it needs to be built from, from, from local people and the trust needs to be there. And what we see is that, that you can connect, I mean, if you want to start new systems, it, the idea should come from local cities. And, and what we see is that you start with the connection of schools and hospitals, those big consumers, and then they're connected. The Netherlands is a great example. Uh, we just made a paper comparing the build-out of natural gas infrastructure in the UK and the Netherlands with district heating build-out in Denmark. There's a lot of governmental uh, interplay in all of these kind of things. So we have to realize that, that this is really a, a, a partnership between high-level government and local, local, uh, local uh, municipalities. Thank you very much for the questions. Thank you for the uh, replies and answers and comments from the panel and, and the speakers uh, for this session. It's coming to an end. I have a couple of household remarks. I would like, although, to add just that the Danish government is also trying to pass on, uh, along with companies and consultants uh, and the Danish Board of District Heating and other players, is trying to pass on knowledge from Denmark. So we try to be an open book. Uh, to whomever in the UK or in uh, in Germany, I see uh, you, uh, also represented here, uh, maybe somebody else from other countries as well. So I hope that the ones that are with us online or in this room will come and ask to enable you in your country or your situation to, to learn more and maybe help you to build that trust or build that knowledge base in your home uh, base to, to grow this uh, fantastic uh, system. Anyway, a couple of practical remarks. Uh, the Pixie books that were mentioned, uh, we have a couple of, uh, of Pixie books here. It white, it's called White Papers. One is on district heating. It's uh, easy to read and it's easy to understand and it, it gives you the highlights of what is district heating and, and different uh, cases and scenarios and a lot of knowledge in that, along with a, a couple of other relevant technologies uh, when we talk about energy efficiency. I highly recommend those White Papers for you to read. Um, I highly recommend you this afternoon, after this, at 11 o'clock, there'll be a new workshop on Power2X uh, in a few minutes. Uh, then there's lunch, then there's a site visit at uh, one of the supermarkets we heard about, which is located nearby here. So a bus will take us there to have a look with our own eyes how they use surplus heat for heating their store and the surroundings uh, uh, around the company. So um, that being said, uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, next uh, workshop starts on Power2X starts at 11 o'clock. Thank you.